Welcome to Robotics and Automation News Webinars, where you can be part of a global event without leaving your home or office. Attend our live webinars and communicate directly with influential professionals in your industry. Hello, my name is Abdul Montekim. I'm editor of Robotics and Automation News.com. In this interview, I speak to Dr. Richard Soley, CEO of the Object Management Group and Executive Director of the Industrial Internet Consortium. The IIC provides a platform for large industrial companies to test and develop technologies for the industrial internet, as Richard explains. My name is Dr. Richard Mark Soley, and I'm Chairman and CEO of the Object Management Group, which is a 30-year-old standards organization. And I'm also Executive Director of the Industrial Internet Consortium, the OMG, or Object Management Group, is a, an organization that develops standards in about 30 different verticals as well as, as, well as horizontal standards such as uh, modeling standards and, and middleware standards. Um, and we, uh, we also run m many other ecosystems, including the Consortium for IT Software Quality, which does software quality metrics. And probably most interesting for this conversation, uh, as I mentioned, I'm Executive Director of the Industrial Internet Consortium, a group of about 250 companies from 30 different countries that uh, are trying to figure out how to use in the IoT in industrial settings, in healthcare, in transportation, in manufacturing and production, smart cities, smart buildings, agriculture, and so forth. Right, and uh, if you could uh, give us a bit more, uh, maybe examples and, and highlight some interesting things uh, that are happening in these uh, uh, workshops or, or sandboxes, I can't remember the term you use, but uh, yeah, well, how, what, are they, what are they like? Well, we use the term test bed because it's kind of a proof of concept, but it's not in, always intended as a directly go to market solution. Uh, for example, um, everyone assumes that IoT will give you some sort of safety and, and efficiency gains in manufacturing and production, but we don't know exactly what those gains would be. So what we do is we start with our business solutions and, and lifecycle group, try to figure out which uh, which uh, use cases are likely to be affected best by uh, Internet of Things, as I say, in many different vertical markets. Uh, our first test bed is one that we developed uh, that was led by Bosch in southwestern Germany in Hamburg. Um, it's uh, it's called track and trace, and what they've done, what they the, the, what they've done is a very simple use case. If we knew where everything was in the factory, people, parts, work in progress, and tools, could we make the factory safer and could we make it more efficient? I think the answer is obviously yes, but the, but the, that's not enough of an answer. We need to understand what are the best practices, what are the software standards that would have made it easier to build that solution. Um, so the, we started that a little over four years ago, um, and uh, they have been pouring out results, the, uh, both best practices results, uh, training results, um, and results in terms of requirements for new software solutions and new standards, um, which are shared with uh, about 37 different standards organizations, which then take those requirements and turn them into standards that, that can be, make industrial IoT um, um, easier to build. See, I mean, we're starting from the point of view that nobody really knows how to build an uh, in IoT solutions in industry, in those industries that I mentioned. So the best way to figure out how to do it is instead of top-down trying to define everything, we do it bottom-up. That is, start with the problem, start with the end user, the end user, the end use, and then figure out what technology will make it possible. So, for example, if you know where all the people are and where all the robot arms are in a factory, and you can stop the robots when they become dangerous to human beings in the factory. Um, that's obviously a safety gain. Uh, you don't have to put your, and an efficiency gain because you don't have to put your robots in, in, a, in cages all over the place. If you know where the tools are and you know where the people are, you can know, know that they pick up a tool that is dangerous and they shouldn't have it uh, in an area that's, uh, that's not uh, safe for that tool, or that they haven't been trained to use that tool. Or that it should be the tool should be uh, say if it's a turning tool that it should be turned to a certain torque and not pass that torque for the certain part and a certain work in progress. All that's possible if you know where everything is: people, parts, work in progress, and tools on the floor of a factory. Similarly, we have a test bed not in manufacturing and automation, but in smart buildings, uh, a building outside Tokyo in Japan, 
which has 35,000 sensors sensing occupancy, temperature, um, uh, humidity, light, telephone usage, and so forth, which knows, which is, we're learning, the, the, the building is learning, not we, but the building is learning how best the building should be used for comfort and for maintainability by tracking uh, 35,000 sensors, 300 terabytes a day, which is, brings in AI because there's no human being that can possibly look at 300 terabytes a day. So we have about 26 of these projects worldwide, likely to be joined by four new ones from the Open Fog Consortium, which joined us uh, just a couple of months ago. And, uh, and we're learning how to build industrial IoT solutions. We already have some, um, some outputs, which we're making available in our resource hub, available for anyone to use at hub.iiconsortium.org. Um, you mentioned uh, Bosch. As far as I know, Bosch is one of the pioneers of um, uh, in this field. I think uh, one of their senior executives uh, first coined the phrase Industry 4.0, which is all about connecting sensors uh, or installing sensors onto machines and uh, collecting data from those machines, uh, having those sensors send back the data through the network to uh, computing uh, systems and as you say there's a lot of data being collected now by in various contexts and uh, ai ai gets involved i mean you have a background in ai um in terms of a long-term sort of a professional background in, in it i mean what is the difference what what it what specifically uh, can ai do uh, can it actually decide by itself to, for example, switch off the lights in one room or switch off the machine that's not being used or, or something like that? Can it manage uh, a, a building or a facility in that way where you can kind of leave it to, to do, the, do the basic uh, decision making for a lot of, lot of, in, in a lot of instances? So there's a lot of questions embedded in what you just said. First of all, uh, I'm, not, I'm not clear on who invented the term Industry 4.0. Uh, I've heard that it might have been, uh, it might have been uh, Henning Kagerman of Akatech, um, lately of SAP. Uh, there might have been Sigmund Dice of, of Bosch. Uh, who knows who it was, but I will tell you that uh, I don't like the term at all because it's, you're always trying to figure out which industry revolution before this brought us to number four. And I think that uh, numbering the revolutions doesn't really work because they overlap. Uh, and we prefer the term in industry Internet of Things, that is the use of Internet of Things in, in, uh, in various industries. Um, I, I, I should say that uh, it has a very simple definition, IoT. That is, as you say, collecting information from a large number of sensors, potentially, potentially a very large number of sensors, doing real-time predictive an analysis on that information based on historical data, and then having output in the real world. It's that having output in the real world that brings me to the last point in, in, in your question, which is, what do we do with the data so, uh, so, such that it, it, it's useful to the real world? So it, it may require AI. So in the Bosch example that I gave you, it doesn't require AI. We, we've learned that uh, we can, we, for example, stop robots when they become, uh, when humans become too close to them, or that we can tell people where the tool is that they, that will complete the job that they have to do next. Where AI enters the picture is where the amount of data is just in, in, too large for a human being to deal with. So again, that example in, uh, in our deep learning test bed in, uh, in, in outside Tokyo, that's generating 300 terabytes of data a day. There is no human being that can possibly look at 300 terabytes of data. Two and a half petabytes of data every week. Forget it, it's not a chance. You're right, I, have, I do come from the AI world. I was an expert system developer in 1981 when I was clearly only two years old. Um, that was supposed to be humor, sorry. Um, uh, but uh, uh, some things have changed, for example, um, the, the, the computer in my pocket, otherwise known as my mobile phone, has all the power of all of the computers that were at MIT when I first entered in the 1970s. Um, computers are somewhere between a million and 10 million times faster than they were 40 years ago. That does make a difference. Memory costs nothing. 
I bought a memory card in 1978, a VME triple height card for a VAC station, which I seem to remember was 64 kilobytes and cost $16,000. Now I have in my right pocket two gigabytes, which cost about $5 just in case I need them. Um, and so, so memory costs nothing. Processors are cost nothing. They're much, much faster. And I think we all forget, uh, it's important for IoT, communications are ubiquitous. That is, I can connect to, to, to at, at this moment to tens of millions of processors from Amazon Web Services, from Google, from Salesforce, from whomever, and get as much compute power as I possibly want for the next few minutes and uh, renting those computers. What makes that possible, of course, is the, uh, the ubiquity of the internet. And the ubiquity of the internet is, is, and the ubiquity of hardware that deals with internet solutions makes it possible to build IoT solutions into anything we want. So uh, yes, uh, it is true that uh, AI is going to make it possible, is making it possible today to turn it on, on and off the lights automatically. But it's going to do what we want it to do. And that is in the case of our smart building in outside Tokyo, um, we're learning how the building is used and we're going to turn on, the AI system will turn on and off the lights as the building is used, as people walk into the room, as the occupancy sensors turn on, not just randomly. Yeah, it's Not yet Skynet. Yeah, well, that's the worry, isn't it? That's the um, yeah, subtext of my questions. How does it, uh, how long before it does get to that point where AI, AI is controlling maybe not the whole world, but really large geographical areas, um, uh, very large facilities spread out across different parts of the world. The potential is clearly there. I, I'm sure you, I don't know if you, you agree. I mean, you know about this more, more than me, but um, what, are, what, what are the, I mean, you, you mentioned before in a different conversation about um, uh, a town or a city uh, project. I don't know. What are the largest projects that you can think of to highlight? Uh, the, the building obviously is generating a, a lot of data, but in terms of a geographical area or, or simple space, uh, what are the largest areas there? And maybe the numbers of people involved, numbers of machines, what are the largest projects that you can think of? That's a, a good question. First of all, I should clarify, AI means different things to different people. I think to a lot of people, who don't know much about the field, AI simply means trying to make a computer think like humans being, human beings think. And that is that's pretty far off. Uh, I've seen estimates of 50 years, 100 years, even 1,000 years. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime, for example. I'm more interested in AI for, for real value, which is, uh, is here today. And that is, or as Marvin Minsky used to put it, one of my professors at MIT, and one of the creators of the field of artificial intelligence in 1959, he used to say, uh, AI is anything a computer can do that you didn't think it can do. In 1961, that may have been just a quick sort, um, a major invention from the Stanford and MIT AI labs. But these days, it, it means recognizing things uh, with a machine learning system, um, which I'll note has problems. I mean, machine learning systems are linear and, and they, uh, can't explain why they make decision, the decisions that they make. So it's going to be a while before we have uh, single AI systems running very large areas. But I'll give you an example of another project that we have, uh, a smart city project in Southern Ireland, in Cork, County Cork, a, a province of Southern Ireland, um, that integrates the healthcare information of the Republic of Ireland, which maintains healthcare information on all residents of the island, uh, of the Republic, pardon me, um, as well as connecting to the provincial data resources of the ambulance services of County Cork. Uh, and when an ambulance is now on its way, this project is run by Dell EMC, uh, when an ambulance is on its way to your house, it downloads the, uh, your, your health data from the national resources and the ambulance uh, paramedics know how, better, how best to treat you based on whether you have Alzheimer's, uh, whether you have diabetes, uh, what allergies you have, and so forth. And more importantly, on the way back to the hospital from your home, uh, they're going to upload, they do upload information about what they've done in the ambulance so they can make a decision based on where the best hospital is. And as long as the hospital is in County Cork, it's going to have all your health data already 
and all, what they've done in the, in the ambulance on the way back to the hospital, already in the, in the hospital before the ambulance arrives. Can you imagine the difference? We're pretty sure we've saved lives. So I think these are valuable technologies, but we have to understand the limitations of technology. There's a, a graduate student at, at the MIT Media Lab that can fool any machine learning system to think that it was looking at, uh, at guacamole. And uh, I do remember his demonstration when he showed a picture of a turtle and they fed it through the uh, machine learning system and said, ah, guacamole, everybody laughed. Then he took a picture of a machine gun, fed it through the same machine learning system and it said, ah, guacamole, and nobody laughed. We're not anywhere near human intelligence in AI systems. We're decades away. But we do have enough expertise and enough compute power, enough ubiquity of communications, and enough memory to do some amazing things. Uh, I'll give you an, a simple example. In 1983, when I was at MIT, I, I developed uh, as a graduate student a voice recognition system that ran on a mainframe. And uh, it very, very slowly did a fair, not good, but fair job of understanding um, a trained person's voice. Well, I carry a voice recognition system everywhere I go now. It's, now. it's called my mobile phone. And uh, it certainly doesn't have to communicate with anyone. It can do it all locally. That's because there's a lot more power in the phone and it can run it in real time. Right, I, I, there's loads of uh, areas that I could go into, but one of the um, things that people seem interested, our readers seem interested in uh, are things like uh, terms like smart factories and lights out manufacturing and, and uh, facilities and things like that. So let me uh, try and um, uh, or ask you to provide insight into that. So you've got, uh, first of all, what is a smart factory? I get the feeling people kind of know uh, or can guess, but um, you know, maybe you could give your own uh, definition of it. And also, what are the components of an IoT system, an industrial IoT system? Uh, routers, sen sensors, you've mentioned routers and th things like that. Other things that are maybe being developed uh, specifically for this kind of network uh, that are new and maybe uh, being tested in your test beds uh, and so on. I, I notice from the work that I do, press releases that come in, um, that there are new uh, routers and whatever the components there are for this kind of um, networking uh, trend. But uh, uh, you can give, uh, give some uh, more um, insight into that than me, I'm sure. So you took that in several directions. Well, let me start with what are the, what's the new technology that's going to be in, in, our, in our factories and what it's going to enable. First of all, the phrase smart factory, unfortunately, doesn't mean enough. Uh, neither does lights on manufacturing. I remember when I was working in a manufacturing setting in 1979, we used lights out manufacturing to talk about the factory of the future, which would, which would involve one person and one dog. The person is there to feed the dog, and the dog isn't there to make sure the person doesn't touch anything. <laughs> we thought that was funny anyway. Um, I, I do think the factory of the future not only has communicating devices on the floor, but predictively understands which parts of the factory are going to have problems in real time and, and tells the uh, maintenance people, you know, repair this, this, uh, this piece of equipment because it's just going to break in just a minute. But more than that, with our Bosch testbed, for example, we're able to know for each person what his or her next project is supposed to be, which parts he or she is going to need, which work in progress is coming down the line to him or her next, and most importantly, where the tool is. Um, and one of Bosch's customers, one, one of the factories that uses Bosch Rexroth tools, they actually uh, spent 46% of the time looking for the tool, next tool for the, for the next job. In that factory today, based on uh, results of our test bed, the, the uh, uh, voice in, the, in, in your ear says, your next project is to put such and such a part on such and such a work in progress and the tool is 10 meters behind you on the left side. You can imagine the, the, the difference in productivity and efficiency. So that I think is really the factory of the future. Not only factories that do some things by themselves and perhaps with the lights out, but factories that integrate much better with the human beings that have to do the jobs on the floor that robots can yet do. Um, and you also asked about what are the new devices that we're going to see. 
I, I don't know if it's uh, entirely new devices, but for example, I think CNC machines are, are going to speak network protocols other than PROFINET and uh, Modbus and so forth. Well, they should speak internet protocols, TCP, IP, because there's so many devices, billions of devices in the world today that use internet protocols. And it's very easy to write applications that use those internet protocols. So I think we're going to see a new generation of, of, uh, of, of controllers, CNCs, and so forth that, that speak internet protocols. And we're also going to see devices and routers and so forth that uh, attached to existing brownfield devices because uh, in this marketplace of, of machine automation, we don't replace our devices every year. We replace them every 30 or 40 years. So uh, one of our test beds is uh, trying to discover the best, the best devices that can be glued onto, attached to brownfield devices so they can be modernized so they can watch the, uh, the vibration, watch the turning, watch whatever it is that they do and look for examples of, of when they're likely to break down because you've seen thousands of hours of that machine, including breakdowns in the past. That's gonna require some machine learning and back to AI, of course. So IoT is a very simple idea, capturing information from, a, from sensors, potentially a very large number of sensors, real time and then predictive analysis based on that information and having effect on the real world. Some of that effect on the real world is going to be through robots, some of that effect on the real world is going to be through human beings. Yeah, there's a huge amount of automation, obviously, in factories, uh, has been for decades now. And, uh, you know, it's just interesting to think how far it can go, uh, especially now with the, these networks coming in, industrial internet of things, networks coming in, um, you know, how much more automated things can be. But, uh, the idea of a smart factory without anybody in them is probably a long way away, as you as you suggest. And one of the other things, um, just on the point of devices, um, that interests me is that I think I've heard the question asked before: Are PLCs, programmable logic controllers, uh, special types of computers that are designed to control robots and things like that, um, are they going to be replaced by, you know? PCs, just uh, average uh, computers, personal computers. And uh, things like teach pendants and, and other tablet type devices, are they gonna be you know, replaced by yeah, the average iPhone or uh, iPad? I know iPhone and iPad and things like that are used more and more, but what's the, what, what do you observe about that trend uh, of uh, what you might call the industry specific uh, computing equipment like PLCs and uh, mainstream technology like desktop PCs and, and tablets and so on. So uh, in 1979 and 1980, I worked for uh, a predecessor of, of Gould called Modicon on a Modicon 584 programmable controller, a PLC. That PLC is now marketed by Schneider Electric and it's called the Schneider Electric 984. And even in 1979, inside it, it had a 68,000 chip for Motorola, such as uh, many, um, many PCs had in those days, too. The difference is that it was programmed in a different way with ladder logic, as you know. Um, and it, was, uh, it, was, well, it wasn't integrated with the IT resources of the factory, mostly because it's, it, even today, it might speak PropyNet or Modbus or something else, but it didn't speak TCPIP. Today it has an ethernet connection, but not a TCP ethernet connection. And therefore it's difficult to integrate uh, uh, that information that comes from the PLC with the IT and, and resources. I think you're gonna see more PCs on the floor as, as well as uh, we've already seen PCs replace all kinds of specialized devices like CAD devices in, in, the, in, the, in, the rest, in the other markets. I think we're gonna see uh, people use their own smartphones as, instead of tablets that are specialized but what we have to see before then is a level of reliability and security that we are not yet seeing in the PC marketplace. It's, uh, the, that, that marketplace has always valued low price over high security, low price over high, uh, high reliability. And in the manufacturing and automation space, we value reliability. We have an expectation that this device is going to keep working. So I think it's going to be a little while, but not very long before we see no difference between a PLC 
and a PC performing as a PLC. The same way we now see in, the, in other markets, a PC performing as an oscilloscope instead of, uh, instead of off, the sh off the shelf oscilloscopes. Okay, and uh, lastly, I think, uh, I, if you don't mind, uh, I'll ask you for your observations about uh, uh, what you might call edge or embedded computing or both. Um, and uh, one of the things I uh, wanted to bring in, if you like, one of the things I find interesting is that new, uh, the new generation of chips, microprocessors that are being developed that are specifically designed for AI tasks. Uh, Apple has uh, you know, done this and uh, probably other companies in the smartphone sector anyway. I know microcontrollers are supposed to be uh, task-specific processors rather than general processors. But they see, I don't know what the, why the new sort of um, buzz about the processors that are specifically geared uh, towards uh, certain tasks, AI tasks, for example. I mean, the microcontrollers. I, I don't know what the what the uh, difference is between them, and what what kind of um, computing uh, trend are you seeing in edge computing and embedded computing? Can a lot of it be done away from the centralized computer? You know, uh, can a load of uh, data be processed at the at the edge, uh, at the machine, without having to re revert back to the central computer or even the cloud? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I would say, first of all, the recognition that people are putting, especially deep learning, or I should say machine learning solutions inside chips, is the recognition by people at Berkeley, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and the people at uh, NVIDIA Corporation, who realized that the algorithms that are inside deep learning look very much like the algorithms that are inside um, um, graphics processors and, and they took the opportunity to sell their graphics processors as deep learning solutions. But uh, the, that, that, that will be integrated in with chips, but it has nothing to do with whether the decision is made to make to do computing at the edge somewhere in the fog or all the way back in the cloud. But that has to do only with where the compute power is physically and how much communications bandwidth you have between your different so different pieces of the solution. If I've got a lot of power in my edge processor, which is paired with my CNC or my PLC or something else, and, and I have low uh, bandwidth back to the cloud through the fog, I'm gonna do a lot of processing on the edge because that's where the compute power is. But if I've got not much compute power, so like a dust, dust solution, um, I don't know if you've heard of dust, but this is the idea that you can uh, you can throw tiny little processors all over a field, something that came out of Berkeley. Um, if I have very little compute power, but I've got lots of bandwidth back to the back to, to processors somewhere in the fog or all the way all the way back in the cloud, I'm going to do the compute in the cloud. So it really has to do with bandwidth and cost. Uh, and uh, I think people to keep that in mind and look at our edge computing work uh, over the last two years will understand that's how you make the decision, not, not because of uh, today's exciting new technology is edge computing. It's where your compute power costs, how much compute power you have, and uh, how much bandwidth you have to other compute power somewhere in the, process, in the, in the, in the scheme. And that might, it might be in the middle, it might be in the cloud, and it might be at the edge. This is nothing new, by the way. Uh, I like to point out that in 1978, I worked, when I was working in Honeywell, um, the, uh, had a lot of compute power in the CPUs. It was a multiprocessor computer, um, but it didn't like to be woken up for I.O. a lot. So we had a front-end processor that did the I.O. That would now be called cloud computing because the, 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 at, at the edge, there was a device a terminal that did the I.O. In the middle, uh, it was a front-end processor that dealt with I.O. without waking up the main central processor. Um, and the central processor cost a lot of money to run, so you only woke it up when the I.O. was ready. Yeah, I find it really interesting uh, to... Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that that kind of like the mode of computation is something we still do based on, on uh, where the compute power is, how much it costs, and how much communications bandwidth we've got uh, available. Yeah, I find it very interesting to wonder what is the most effective way to do something. I mean, if you look at a 
humanoid robot, which you can consider to be a you know the IoT network of sorts. You've got the central computer, which is the brain, and uh, I wonder, uh, you know, often wonder, should there be computing uh, embedded in the arms and every joint of it, right down to its toes and uh, uh, and fingers? I mean, I wonder uh, if humans have computing power or the equivalent of computing power in uh, in our fingertips and joints. I mean, how much of it is computing? Uh, at the edge and how much of it is it does it go back to the brain for you know for decision making i, I often wonder that but in in industry i suppose um the main thing is to find efficiencies and to you know maybe more be more productive and so on that's the discipline if you like it's not about what performs the best what what, what is the uh, most effective way to do something I mean, what are the what are the imperatives? What are the motivating factors? I mean, it seems obvious to say it's efficiencies and more production. Um, what what are the what are the kind of what insight can you give in, into that in terms of what motivations are for the people or the companies that are involved in the test beds? And I, you've told me before that they do share information, and uh, that kind of environment obviously is going to create uh, uh, more innovation and so on and what, what are the motivations that they have for, for this kind of work so first uh, on your on your issue uh, with uh, whether there's compute power in the in the in the joints um, there is a little tiny bit by the way in human beings uh, for example if, uh, if your finger senses heat uh, like it, uh, you've left it on a stove or something like that that information is, is it goes, it goes back through the pain sensors to your medulla oblongata, but it does not go to your cerebrum or cerebellum. Uh, it moves very quickly, immediately back to your joints that move your hand away from the heat. So there is, uh, especially for some emergency situations, some kind of compute power that, is, that does not involve the central processing unit. And I think you, you see in, in robots such as those from uh, humanoid robots from, from uh, uh, Boston Dynamics, for example, there's a lot of compute power that's in the machine, but there's also a lot of compute power that's off the machine. And again, it's going to have to do with how much bandwidth you have and where the cost of com computation is lower. Um, and, and to your question as to why people participate in the testbed program, I think it's the, the understanding that there's a lot to learn in terms of architecture. So we have an architecture group, security. We have a security group that has developed a security framework and a security maturity model. A great way to benchmark where you are in the in, 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 in securing your systems, um, and they are trying to work together uh, to to find their best solutions and publish them as best practices, and also take the things that they have to build, the software they have to build, and say, if we standardize this, we could have the next time we can take it off the shelf rather than build it, and uh, and uh, so for example, our Bosch testbed that I keep mentioning has had an output. Um, they, they built a, a tool called Forto for, um, for managing the sensors on the factory floor. And they didn't really want to have to build that tool. Uh, so they open sourced it to the Eclipse Foundation and they brought the, the requirements to the object management group for standardization by our manufacturing task force. Um, and that's exactly what we hope to learn by building these systems. I, I tell people all the time, you probably have some of the smartest people in the world, but I've got all of them because we've got hundreds of companies that are working together and sharing knowledge and, and moving forward, creating innovation for IoT in, in industries. Okay, I will thanks. honestly tell you that I thought that I thought there would be cases where they would want to keep that information private. Um, that hasn't happened yet. They are quite willing to share the information and there's quite a lot available today on our, on our resource hub. Yeah, that is something that uh, I wouldn't say surprised me, but it wouldn't have would not have surprised me if uh, some companies wanted to keep certain innovations to themselves so they can gain some sort of a competitive advantage. But uh, yeah, it's as I say, it's a very good um, way to make progress overall for everyone, really. Um, Richard, thank you very much for your time. Uh, is there something uh, I should have asked that you wanted to say? That was pretty broad ranging, Abdul. So I, I thank you for the questions. I hope that I give you something usable as an answer.
Oh, no, definitely. It's all usable. I just wonder, I often worry that I ask people questions that is outside, that are outside of their area of expertise and they might not want to talk about. Um, so I hope I didn't do that too often. I'm sure I did it a few times. <laughs> no, I was quite happy to talk about AI. You know, this, this is a field in which uh, uh, new technology is really usually only recycled technology from 30 years ago with a new name. So, for example, deep learning or, or machine learning, 30 years ago we called neural networking. But 30 years ago we called artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. Here it is again. It's, it's, a, it's wonderful to see it again. It's like an old friend. Thank you very much. Send us an email at sales at robotics and automationnews.com to register for one of our many upcoming webinars. And if you'd like us to host your webinar, we have a range of options, including long-term lead generation packages and marketing campaigns. We look forward to hearing from you soon.